Great. Good morning. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Danny Hidano. Uh, I've known her as uh, one of my fellows for the past three years, um, but sort of jumped to ahead of her CV. She's going to join us at Harbor View, and I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Hidano, um, another connection that we have is that she uh, got her bachelor's in bioengineering from University of Washington. A um, little known fact about me is that I was one of the very first students in bio undergrad degree in bioengineering 10 years before her. So it was very nice to see sort of how the program has flourished and generated wonderful young women who go into STEM and go on to do great things. Uh, she stayed here for her medical school and then went to University of California, San Francisco for her residency. And we were very lucky to have her come back for, for her uh, fellowship with us. And um, she's uh, been involved um, with um, her uh, research and her interests in meth um, induced cardiomyopathy and is very much interested in working with sort of our underserved population here in the Harbor View, and is I know going looking forward to working with the community heart failure program, and just we're just so very lucky to have her here with us, and uh, I'm excited to hear about meth induced cardiomyopathy. Thank you. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here in person and on Zoom. Ruchi, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in and get started. Um, unless you have burning questions, if you can save your questions to the end, um, I should have a few minutes left over. Um, so today I'll be presenting on methamphetamine-associated cardiomyopathy. Um, it, there is, I just want to emphasize that there's a huge overlap between what we do in cardiology and substance use. Um, if you treat any of these conditions, which all of us do in cardiology, then I think substance use is very relevant to all of you. Um, whether, you know, as disease uh, risk factors, disease modifiers, or um, sometimes uh, when, you're, when you're treating these conditions, having to take into account um, someone's substance use um, is very important in the ultimate success of, of treating that patient. Um, this is a huge scope, and so I really just want to spend the next hour focusing specifically on methamphetamine-associated cardiomyopathy. Um, I'm going to run through sort of the history of uh, the rise of the methamphetamine epidemic um, and talk uh, a little bit about the epidemiology of meth-associated cardiomyopathy. Um, I also will next talk about how we think meth causes uh, damage to the heart, some predictors for potential reversibility. Um, touch on current management strategies, and then share some exciting um, updates on the horizon. I'm going to start with a patient case. Um, this is a 45-year-old man uh, who presents with two weeks of new onset worsening lower extremity swelling and shortness of breath concerning for heart failure. This patient has a past medical history that's notable for opiate use disorder and prior GI bleed. Um, he is unhoused. He's currently living on the streets in Seattle in a tent um, and has for many years and endorses daily IV heroin and IV methamphetamine use. Um, this is his initial echo when he comes to the hospital. Um, you can see that he's got biventricular dilation and a pretty severely reduced uh, left-sided ejection fraction at 22%. His right ventricle is also at least mildly uh, depressed. As a part of new heart failure workup, he does get a coronary angiogram um, that is without any obstructive coronary disease. I think what's most notable is the amount that they have to pan to see his entire heart, just as a reflection of how dilated he is. Um, they perform the rest of the serologic workup for heart failure, and that also is negative, and he's ultimately diagnosed with methamphetamine-associated cardiomyopathy. Um, during the hospital course, the patient was also diagnosed with MRSA bacteremia. He's ultimately discharged to respite for IV antibiotics. While there, he does really well and expresses a desire to stop all substance use. With assistance, he was able to take all of his cardiac medications, the notable cardiac meds being Lisinopril 10, Metoprolol 25, and Lasix 20. Um, and he was attending his clinic appointments. 
Um, fortunately, respite was also able to help get him set up with permanent supportive housing. And so when he was um, discharged from respite, um, he had a place to live. Unfortunately, once he left, he was on his own and he was unable to manage his own medications despite best intentions. Um, this led to recurrent hospitalizations. There were at least three for heart failure and additional hospitalizations for GI bleeds and sepsis. Um, during this time, he was also unable to cut back on either meth or heroin. And a year later, his repeat echo showed an EF drop further to 16%. And provider notes start to mention um, maybe considering hospice at this time. Um, I present this patient's case because I think many of us um, in the audience have encountered patients who are in similar situations as this gentleman. Um, and I, it's really motivated me to learn more about this topic. And I'm excited to um, share with you all what I've learned. Um, and we'll be returning to this patient's case near the end of my presentation. So moving into um, kind of the history that I find very fascinating about the rise of the current meth epidemic that we're seeing today. Um, this is kind of a busy slide, but is highlighting the timeline of how amphetamines were initially discovered and marketed. Um, ephedrine is a naturally derived substance that is uh, found in the ephedra plant. It's been used for hundreds or thousands of years by traditional Chinese medicine. And you can see that the structure of ephedrine is actually very similar to a lot of the you know, human synthesized amphetamines and methamphetamines that we have today. So in the late 1800s, there were Japanese and Romanian scientists that um, isolated ephedrine, made the first uh, amphetamine and methamphetamine. Uh, methamphetamine. Um, then in the 1920s, uh, a lot of scientists were studying amphetamine. They noticed that it increased heart rate and blood pressure, that it caused bronco or bronchodilation and vasoconstriction of the nasal mucosa beds. So of course, um, pharmaceutical companies jumped on that. And in 1932, um, an American pharmaceutical company uh, marketed the first amphetamine inhaler um, termed Benzedrine. This was used for asthma, hay fever, nasal congestion. Um, by 1940, there was then amphetamine tablets that were brought to market. These were um, prescribed for ADHD and narcolepsy. And in the same year, um, there were methamphetamine tablets that were being marketed as well called Methedrine. During World War II, amphetamines and methamphetamines were widely distributed to troops, both on the ax uh, Axis and Allied forces. So um, this was used to increase alertness, um, decrease fatigue, and decrease appetite of um, the military forces. Um, following World War II in the 1950s and 60s, um, I was not previously aware of this, but there was very wide use of methamphetamine. Um, people were using it, like everyday people were using meth for all sorts of things to promote mood and attention, to increase wakefulness, to promote weight loss. Um, it was being uh, marketed to, to people like students, athletes, um, long haul truck drivers, etc. Um, it was also during this time when use really took off and people were really noticing the euphoric and kind of addictive properties um, of amphetamines and methamphetamine. Um, pictured there are some ads that were um, targeted at the general public. Um, a betrol was actually a 50-50% mix of amphetamines and methamphetamine. Um, by the late 1950s, um, there start to be uh, signals that people are developing tolerance and starting to show signs of addiction and mis misuse of these uh, drugs. Um, the FDA um, sort of reacts to, to this growing issue um, that's becoming more apparent by starting to require a prescription for all amphetamines and methamphetamines. Um, then in the 70s, they make uh, these substances a controlled substance. Um, and then by 1996, they're really trying to control the precursors uh, over the counter, really ephedrine and pseudoephedrine that are commonly found in cold medicines even today. Um, they're trying to control the, the sale of those to try and prevent um, ongoing uh, illicit production. Um, what you can see in this graph here is these are the um, meth lab seizures in the US. And you can see that um, by the late or by the early 2000s, there's really a peak and then a fall um, as a result of all of these regulations. So they were successful in kind of stunting the amount of domestic um, methamphetamine production in the US. 
However, um, coinciding with this same point in time, you can start to see that more meth is then being seized at the US-Mexico border, um, which really demonstrates that there was a shift in terms of where the meth in this country is currently coming from, and a lot of it is still being illegally imported. Um, by 2006, the United Nations World Drug Report um, declares that meth is the most abused hard drug on earth. The US and Mexico are not alone in experiencing this problem. Um, you can see that all over the world, there are sort of pockets of um, uh, countries that have high prevalence of methamphetamine uh, and amphetamine use as well. The US is the highest at 3.3% back in 2018. Um, but you can see that parts of Central America, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, and Australia are other places where there's extremely high meth use. Um, since, this, since that time, so from the early 2000s, fast forward to today, this is the most recent data that I can find in terms of the, the prevalence in the US. So this was a national survey conducted in 2022. They surveyed um, people who were 12 and older and asked if they had used any CNS stimulants within the last year. Um, one in 30 people responded yes. Um, you can see that most uh, endorsed cocaine use at 5.3 million, um, 4.3 million were misuse of a prescription stimulant, and then 2.7 million um, endorsed meth use. Um, of the 2.7, 1.8 million people um, reported a use disorder. And I think um, what's uh, notable is that this survey did not um, survey either um, homeless or incarcerated individuals. And so these numbers may actually be much higher. Um, I wanna mention that methamphetamine adversely affects every organ system. This was a PET scan that was done. They um, tagged methamphetamine and then administered it to this patient and, and image where in the body um, methamphetamine goes. And you can see that it's taken up by um, a bunch of different organs. I think historically we focused a lot on the CNS and the heart side effects, mainly because those can cause immediately life-threatening conditions such as stroke, um, uh, hypertensive emergency, heart failure and shock, um, life-threatening arrhythmias, and coronary vasospasm, which presents like ACS and chest pain. Um, but there are a number of other, um, maybe lesser known effects of meth that can be equally detrimental over the long term. Um, as you might expect with the growing um, meth methamphetamine epidemic, um, you it also, um, uh, the hospitalizations that are related to amphetamines have also sort of followed that. You can see that um, this is based on U.S. data, and you can see here on the West Coast that we really have the highest prevalence of amphetamine-related hospitalizations. Focusing specifically on meth-related heart failure, um, this graph really shows um, the number of methamphetamine uh, heart failure hospitalizations per 1,000 heart failure hospitalizations. Um, you can see in the darker red color on the West Coast where we are located that we have an extremely high prevalence of meth-related heart failure as compared to other parts of the country. Um, our rate is 500 times greater than that um, that is seen in, new, in the New England area. And this is data from um, 2020. Um, similar to us on the West Coast, California, a lot of uh, studies have come out of um, this area. And what they've highlighted is that from in the 10 year period from 2008 to 2018, meth related heart failure admissions have increased 600%, um, now accounting for 8% of all heart failure hospitalizations. Um, similarly, that from the same study in 2018, um, they estimated that California spent almost $400 million on meth heart failure. To back up for just a minute, um, to define what meth-associated cardiomyopathy is, you know, there's no formal diagnostic criteria, but from the research studies and from what we, um, what I've seen clinically, we tend to diagnose someone with meth-associated cardiomyopathy if they have heart failure with a history of methamphetamine use and exclusion of other uh, common causes such as ischemic disease. Um, the patient population that's typically affected are younger than what you would see for an ischemic uh, mediated heart failure patient. Um, in the studies that I saw, the onset of heart failure tends to be 10 to 20 years younger. Um, for whatever reason, there's also a very strong male predominance of meth-related heart failure, 
the cohorts um, cite anywhere from 60 to 93% of um, the meth heart failure cohorts being male. Um, these patients also have um, more prevalence of socioeconomic uh, disparity. And so you can see that a lot of patients are on um, uh, state-sponsored insurance or uninsured. Um, a lot of our patients are also um, dealing with housing instability, and there's a higher prevalence of psychiatric disorders and other comorbid substance use, but lower risk or lower rates of traditional risk factors um, that we're used to seeing associated with heart failure. The typical echo findings are, are noted here. So starting uh, on the left, you can see that uh, meth-related heart failure typically will present with pretty severe left-sided dilation and systolic dysfunction. Um, this can progress to then see left atrial enlargement, and then if more severe, you'll also see right-sided involvement, which can be both dilation and dysfunction. Um, the next image over, in addition to the first image, both show um, examples of intracardiac thrombi. Um, from the echoes that I've seen um, at Herberview, I mean, I think that it is true that these intracardiac thrombi are actually um, diagnosed pretty commonly in this patient population. Um, uh, moving on, um, functional MR and TR are also common, and that's just secondary to the ventricular dilation that we typically see. Pulmonary hypertension um, is also something that can either be due to left-sided failure or there's also a toxin-mediated primary PAH that we can um, that can result from meth. Um, and then lastly, um, if someone is not presenting more as the four chamber dilation and dysfunction, but is presenting more acutely, occasionally you'll see actually more of a stress cardiomyopathy pattern. Um, and uh, I'll get in a little more to that. Uh, in a little bit. Um, what I find interesting about meth heart failure is that um, there's variable onset in terms of when patients start using and from the time that they develop heart failure symptoms. On average, from what I saw, the, the time is about five years, um, but 20% will develop heart failure within one year. Um, as you might imagine, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, different um, features of use that might uh, affect this, such as route of use, um, potency of the drug, um, frequency and duration of use. There may also be genetic underlying factors, such as people have brought up whether or not there might be a two-hit hypothesis with someone who has a pathologic um, gene that might predispose them to cardiomyopathy, and then meth is the second hit. Um, I also mentioned the sex predominance of this uh, condition primarily affecting men, which we don't fully understand. Um, and then various comorbidities. So traditional cardiac risk factors certainly could affect the timing of onset of when someone's going to develop heart failure. And we also know that alcohol, when used in conjunction with methamphetamine, um, is particularly toxic to the heart. Um, so the way in which meth causes damage to the heart, um, it, a lot of people have um, cited the sympathetic or catecholamine um, surge that is uh, a result of methamphetamine use. Um, the euphoric effects can often decline after a few hours, um, but the sympathetic effects of methamphetamine may persist much longer. And so this can lead to kind of repetitive use um, and stacking of the cardiovascular effects. Binge use in particular, which is continuous use for multiple days, is thought to be particularly detrimental to the heart. And all of these catecholamines can cause a variety of complications um, in the heart, particularly demand ischemia from the elevated heart rate and blood pressure, um, coronary vasospasm, arrhythmias, um, stress cardiomyopathy. And with repetitive insult, um, all of these things can lead to fibrosis over time. Um, we also know that even with trying to control for sympathetic overdrive, that there is still evidence of fibrosis in rodent models. And so there's also a theory that meth is also directly toxic to myocytes. Um, this is one of the rodent models that demonstrated really nicely um, the, the time-dependent um, cardiac muscle damage that's induced by methamphetamine. So they took 30 control mice and 30 mice that were injected with subcutaneous methamphetamine every day. Um, you can see at baseline or the control mice, that's what normal um, uh, 
myocardium should look like. And even after just 14 days, you can start to see that there's evidence of myocyte degeneration and infiltration of inflammatory cells. And by 56 days, you can see that there's pretty clear um, uh, like contraction bands and evidence of fibrosis. Um, in human studies, these are endocard endomyocardial biopsies that are taken from three different patients that reported um, different durations of Methuse. And similar to the, the mouse model, you can see that with longer reported um, methamphetamine use, you can see just more, um, more fibrosis and more myocyte disarray. And so this study um, looked at actually 30 different endomyocardial biopsies, and they were able to conclude that longer duration of Methuse was associated with more fibrosis, and that was statistically significant in their study. The same study also concluded that fibrosis extent was independently associated with improvement in cardiac function after the cessation of Methuse. So you might next be wondering, what about cardiac MRI as a predictor of um, you know, or as an assessment of to see how much fibrosis someone might have? Um, the answer is yes, we do see patients quite frequently have LGE on their cardiac MRIs. This was a study of about 30 patients as well. It was retrospective. They just looked at any meth cardiomyopathy patients who had undergone an MRI. Um, and they reported that 76% of patients had LGE, but that the, the pattern of LGE was quite variable. Um, I would say 60% of patients had um, LGE in the mid wall, which the authors theorized was maybe due to chronic inflammation and maybe repetitive stress, whereas the subendocardial and transmural LGE um, maybe was more related to um, ischemia leading to infarct from potentially vasospasm. Um, they did rule out obstructive coronary disease in all of these patients, and so um, I think that's how they concluded that vasospasm might be um, might explain some of these LGE patterns. Um, going back to that first study that I showed you with the endomyocardial biopsies, this was, uh, they followed patients longitudinally over time. And after a couple of years, they um, brought patients back and asked them if they had were successful in stopping Methuse or not. And based on that, they showed that in patients who reported abstinence from methamphetamine were able to recover their ejection fraction to 43% as compared to people who continued methamphetamine, their EF stayed around 21%. Similarly, we saw changes of positive remodeling. You can see that their LV and diastolic diameters were also um, smaller um, compared to the patients who continued. Um, additionally, this study concluded that patients, when they came back, had lower um, NYHA class and also lower risk of death um, and rehospitalization from heart failure. Um, so, so far we've discussed that some features that may predict reversibility include extent of myocardial fibrosis and also methamphetamine cessation. Um, other findings that may predict re uh, reversibility include that stress cardiomyopathy pattern that I mentioned. There are a few case series that showed um, that five patients all normalized their EF after six weeks um, when they presented with this kind of pattern. Um, on echo for patients who are presenting more with that chronic cardiomyopathy like picture, the smaller your chamber size is, um, the more likely you were to recover. And I think intuitively that makes a lot of sense. It means that you have less uh, remodeling at that point. Um, and then I would say that the data on LGE is just quite limited at this point. We have only a single case report of a patient who did not have LGE who went on to recover, and then a very small case series of six patients where two of them were lost to follow up. Half of them had LGE and half of them didn't, but I think the recovery um, was pretty mixed. And so um, not to say that there's not potential there, I think that there is, but I think we just need more studies um, looking at the sort of heterogeneous nature of LGE and not just using it as kind of a binary yes, no LGE. Um, so I'm gonna jump ahead to the management of meth-associated cardiomyopathy. I wanted to start by first talking about um, treatment of the underlying substance use disorder. Um, I wanna first emphasize that I think we should all be striving to provide trauma-informed care. For those of you who haven't heard of this term before, it's mainly about understanding how an individual's past and, uh, and present trauma affects their health directly, in addition to how it affects their relationships with other people and their interactions with the healthcare system. I think it's important to consistently check in and try and be aware of your own subconscious biases around substance use and mental health. 
And then lastly, I find it helpful to think about substance use just as you would any other chronic medical condition that requires a formal diagnosis and formal treatment by the medical system. Um, I think in along those same that same vein, I think it's um, helpful to try and understand the reasons why people use. All three of these quotes were taken from a survey um, done here at the University of Washington. And I think the general theme is that um, people are, are trying to do their best and are trying to do what's in the best interest for themselves and oftentimes are driven to use substances either to prevent something negative, whether it's self-treatment of emotional pain or physical pain, or to prevent like the horrendous symptoms that come with withdrawal. Um, or they're using for a very sort of practical and legitimate reason. A lot of our patients are dealing with housing insecurity and many patients endorse using methamphetamine so that they can stay up throughout the night so all of their belongings don't get stolen or so they don't get assaulted. Um, I think as cardiologists, we are all able to assess someone's readiness for change. I think many of us are familiar with sort of the six stages of change that you may have heard in the context of motivational interviewing. And it's just a spectrum that is dynamic and patients um, can, can move up and down the spectrum and that's normal and okay. But I think what I wanna stress is that when we're diagnosing patients in the hospital with really bad heart failure, that specific moment is not always um, the moment in which patients can realistically stop methamphetamine um, immediately. And I think that cessation is not always a realistic goal and that that's okay. I think meeting patients where they're at is incredibly important. And for even for patients who are earlier um, on the readiness for change, I think we can still target things like harm reduction, making sure they have access to clean needles, to offer um, resources for them to obtain fentanyl test strips, which is a way they can test their methamphetamine for contamination with fentanyl to try and prevent accidental overdose. Um, and then to also always just offer a Narcan prescription for these patients. I think if people are further along and are ready uh, to enact change, I think that we can also help facilitate referrals to addiction medicine at this point. Um, another paradigm that I wanna kind of turn on its head, I think a lot of times we focus on the fact that we don't have FDA approved medications uh, to treat stimulant use disorder. The reality is, is, is that is true, but we also do have a lot of other kind of behavioral therapies that are quite effective for treatment of stimulant use disorder for patients who are motivated. Um, and so I think I've just listed a bunch of things here that um, when we refer our patients to addiction medicine, um, maybe strategies that they could use um, for our patients. The one that I'm most excited about is contingency management. Um, for those of you who haven't heard what this is, it's a really exciting um, uh, way to kind of try and modify behavior. Um, it is very effective in stimulant use disorder. In fact, the studies that I saw um, or meta-analysis that I read said that the number needed to treat to get one patient to stop using meth may be as low as four. Um, and this strategy effectively is um, using motivational incentives to reinforce an intended behavior. And I'll give an example. Um, contingency management was directly applied to meth heart failure. Um, they were doing this at UCSF when I was a resident there at San Francisco General, which is very similar um, to our Harborview Hospital. They were piloting something called the Heart Plus Clinic. This was a co-management clinic between cardiology and addiction medicine. The program ran for 12 weeks and their contingency management was set up in, in the way that they would give patients um, grocery store gift cards in exchange for clinic attendance and negative drug screens. Um, I know this protocol is, is kind of small text, but in case you wanted to reference it later, to summarize, um, you know, this was the fishbowl that they use. There's 500 pieces of paper in there. Half of them have a positive affirmation, like good job, keep going, keep it up, written on it. Whereas the other half had some sort of monetary value written on there that could be exchanged for one of the grocery, uh, grocery store gift cards. 42% had a $5 gift card, 8% were $10 and 0.2 was $100. And every time a patient came into clinic, they would get to draw um, uh, out of the fishbowl. Additionally, if they had a negative urine drug screen, they would get an additional draw from the fishbowl. And for every time they came back to clinic without missing a, an appointment, they were able to draw more and more um, out of the fishbowl. 
And so in this way, it was reinforcing um, the positive behaviors that of uh, coming to clinic um, and, and submitting a clean urine uh, drug screen. If they had missed an appointment, then the count would just reset um, back to the beginning. Um, and their results were really exciting. This was um, uh, data from both their pilot study and then their subsequent follow-up cohort. Um, they found that 100% of patients reported decreased stimulant use just over this 12-week program. And three patients, or 14%, were able to stop completely. And again, this was a very short-term um, pilot study, but I think those, those results are very impressive. They also showed that engagement in clinic in, improved dramatically. So um, they were able to achieve almost an 80% clinic attendance rate um, and clinic engagement increased fivefold. They also were being co-managed by a cardiologist and for their report, all of patients reached max tolerated GDMT just over the course of these three months. Um, and then lastly, acute care utilization was also reduced by 53%. I think perhaps what's most striking is the cost effectiveness of this program. It was only um, $1.50 per patient per day. In total, over the 12 weeks, the patients received about $1,700 in gift cards. Individual participants, there was quite a range in terms of the amount that patients got, but the median was only $150. And I think when you put that in the context of how much money our country spends on heart failure, um, this is really just a very small drop in a very large bucket. Um, uh, the U.S. spends an estimated, you know, 39 to 60 billion dollars on heart failure every year, um, with hospitalizations accounting for the vast majority of that cost. An average hospitalization in the U.S. is anywhere from 10,000 to 17,000 dollars. And so, doing the math, you can see that if we could use contingency management or some of these other strategies to reduce one or two hospitalizations over the course of the year, you've paid for contingency management for like 10 years. Um, I think what's really exciting is that from what I read, uh, contingency management has been available at the VA hospital since 2011, and it's been very successfully utilized there for a variety of substance use disorders, not just stimulants. Um, and just kind of Googling in the news, I, I saw that uh, Washington State Medicaid is now the second state after California to approve contingency management. Um, I haven't seen this widely rolled out yet. I think there needs to be systems and clinics built um, to sort of um, accommodate um, more contingency management, but I think this is something really exciting on the horizon that I hope we will see more of. Um, so we just talked about um, treatment of substance use disorder. So to summarize, trauma-informed care is very important. Assessing someone's readiness for change and getting them connected with the appropriate resources. And then um, getting really excited about contingency management and sharing that with our patients um, as a potential strategy down the road. To move on next to heart failure management. Um, uh, this is more within our wheelhouse as cardiologists, um, but I think I wanted to stress that it's the same four pillars of heart failure management that we would use for any of our other HEFREF patients. I would say that there's limited literature on specifically using GDMT in meth-associated cardiomyopathy specifically, but I think it goes to reason that once you've developed pretty severe systolic dysfunction, that there's this presumed benefit that you um, would still see from GDMT from blocking the same maladaptive neural hormonal pathways that we see in heart failure. So beta blockers, RAS inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, and SGLT2 inhibitors are all um, very important to try and get on board. Um, I combed through all of the literature and the only four studies that I could find that reported kind of rates of GDMT utilization are listed here. Um, you can see that beta blockers um, are probably the, the, the category in which we are prescribing the most. Um, I want to sort of debunk the myth of this, uh, the, the dangers of beta blockers in active stimulant use. I think this came up in the early 1990s as, as kind of like case reports here and there. This has been studied very extensively, and there's been a lot of meta-analyses done, and this um, just has not been consistently demonstrated. So I want to emphasize that beta blockers can and should be used in meth-related heart failure when there's a class one indication to do so. Um, Moving on to ACEs and ARBs, again, no specific studies looking specifically at these agents in meth cardiomyopathy, and certainly none of them have reported um, rates of entresto yet. 
And then MRAs are perhaps our worst category um, with the lowest utilization. And I wonder if that's just due to trying to prioritize the two first medication classes with really the most um, efficacy. And maybe people are also worried about the risk of hyperkalemia if these patients were lost to follow up. But either way, I think we can do better. Um, I want to also highlight that a current gap in knowledge is that no studies have really looked at GDMT as an independent um, predictor of clinical outcomes. They've all been kind of under the umbrella of meth cessation. Um, similarly, people haven't looked um, more granularly at like the specific doses or adherence as it relates to clinical outcomes. And so that was really um, the the foundation of what, um, what uh, we were hoping to look at with our registry. Um, so I'm making a registry of meth-associated cardiomyopathy patients with the help of Cooper and Joey, um, who's one of the internal medicine residents here. We collected um, new onset heart failure due to meth over the last few years within our hospital system. We've found 88 patients, and you can see our um, uh, utilization of GDMT and how it stacks up against some of these other related cohorts. And because we were looking um, at a more recent, uh, more recent cohort, we also recorded um, rates of Entresto and SGLT2 inhibitors. And you can see that the rates of these are also in very, very low. Um, the vast majority of our patients are insured with Medicaid. And I just wanna emphasize that Medicaid in Washington state does actually pay for both Entresto and Empagliflozin. And so we really should be trying to get these numbers um, better. This is more granular data also from our same registry. Um, you can see that within each medication class, patients were most likely to be discharged on metoprolol, lisinopril, spironolactone, and empagliflozin, all at pretty modest doses, um, but that there's a lot of patients who are still being discharged with new onset heart failure who are not on any of these agents. And I should mention that all of our heart failure um, that our heart failure patients are all EF less than 40. So really have indications for all four of these medication classes. And the first aim of our study is to really describe kind of provider prescribing patterns and to identify areas in which we could be doing better. Um, next, um, our, we're hoping to calculate an individual GDMT score for each patient. So by drug class, um, each individual could get you know, a range of points depending on what percent of the target dose um, they are on. Um, for each individual patient, the GDM scores across all the drug classes are summed up to get one number. And you can see that that's what's graphed on the right-hand side of the screen. And this is really just a way to try and assess you know, an individual's quality of GDMT. Um, and you can see that most of the patients who were discharged um, with a new diagnosis of heart failure in our system had GDMT scores less than five, whereas very few had GDMT scores of 10 or higher. Um, and to give you a sense of what this GDMT regimen might look like, someone with a score of two is someone who's just being discharged on lisinopril five, whereas someone with a score of 15 is on the lowest dose of Entresto, metoprolol 25, Spiro 25, and MPAG 10. And I put that up there just to say that that's not an unreasonable regimen that we could get our patients to even during the first hospitalization. So I think this will help identify um, that we can do that we can do better. Um, the next step in our study is going to be to correlate those GDMT scores with clinical endpoints such as heart failure hospitalizations, um, change in ejection fraction, and mortality. Um, we hope to calculate similar data for a, com a control group to use as a comparator. Um, and then we also collected um, serial uh, medication data to, to be able to calculate a second GDMT score and follow up. And that's going to be based on prescription dispensing records that are available in EPIC. Um, and I think the reason for doing that is we know that just having an active prescription at discharge doesn't mean that the patient ends up picking up that medicine in, in the real world. And so this is just one step closer at maybe trying to estimate um, real world medication adherence. Um, kind of pivoting back to heart failure management, um, uh, we've just talked about GDMT, now looking our, at primary prevention ICDs. Um, probably not surprising to any of you, but there is a very low reported prevalence of ICDs and meth-associated cardiomyopathy in patients who meet the traditional indications. Um, there were only two studies that cited the, the prevalence of ICDs, and it's somewhere between 15 and 33%. Um, and what I wanted to emphasize is that 
um, patients who present with cardiac arrest due to stimulant use disorder, 24% um, of them are presenting initially with a shockable rhythm. And so it just begs the question, you know, should, would patients benefit from having an ICD? Um, and, and this is in contrast to patients who present with opiate-related overdose cardiac arrest. Um, they're very rarely presenting with a shockable rhythm because they're um, uh, overdose is more likely related to like hypoventilation um, leading to PEA, whereas with stimulant use, perhaps this is more of like a vasospasm or ischemic um, kind of etiology. Um, so to just summarize the gaps in knowledge, you know, I think, as I mentioned, um, GDMT and the association with clinical improvement has not been studied. The effect of GDMT in patients who continue to use meth also has not um, fully been evaluated. And so this is really what we're hoping to address with our registry. And then primary prevention ICDs, really not sure if we should be applying the same criteria to um, this population. Particularly, I wanna highlight that, you know, I did share with you that they have potential to recover with cessation and GDMT. And so, you know, at what point do you pull the trigger and say this person would benefit from an ICD? Similarly, um, we have to take into account that this patient population may be at higher risk of harm from devices, whether that's inappropriate shocks, repetitive shocks, or infection, particularly with transvenous devices. Um, so that was heart failure management. I think the main takeaway is that we should be getting all of our patients on guideline-directed medical therapy. Um, moving on to the last category, so treatment of intracardiac thrombi. This is a short section because uh, we don't know too much about this, but I've shown you now like some pretty impressive um, echoes of patients with very large um, LV thrombi. The rate of intracardiac thrombi may be as high as 33%, and people have theorized that um, the catecholamine surge may lead to sort of a prothrombic state, and in combination with really severe cardiac dysfunction, that kind of leads to this high prevalence of LV thrombi. Um, we frequently diagnose this with um, echo, I think very low threshold to use contrast um, because finding an LV thrombus will definitely change management for the patient. Um, additionally, you can use MRI or CT. And what's been recommended is quote unquote long-term anticoagulation, but there's not really any um, further guidance on how long that is. Um, this echo, uh, the top two images are from admission. This is all the same patient. Um, the top two are from admission where you can see that huge mural thrombus that's kind of hugging the septum going down towards the apex. And then after just seven days of warfarin, you can see that the, while the thrombus is smaller, it also looks very terrifying and is kind of prolapsing in and out of the LVOT and is at risk of embolizing. Um, clinically, there was not signs that this embolized to the brain or any parts of the body, um, and it, it pretty quickly um, dissolved, which is very impressive. Um, but I think gaps remaining in this area remain like, how long do we treat these patients with anticoagulation? Um, are there patients who would benefit from prophylactic anticoagulation given the really high prevalence that we're seeing? Um, are DOACs better than warfarin in this area, particularly if compliance might be better with DOACs? Um, and then what is their risk of embolism? Okay, so that wraps up the management section. Um, I wanted to end this talk by um, sharing some really exciting updates that are happening at Harborview. Um, I'm going to go through each of these one by one. Um, the first is the Harborview Community Heart Failure Program. This is run by Jamie and Kate, who are both here today. Um, they are the founders of this program and really worked tirelessly to get funding and to, to really lift this off the ground. Um, this program is a very intensive and longitudinal um, community-based program where Kate and Jamie go out and meet patients um, in the places that they live or wherever they prefer to get their care. And they're able to do things like medication management, um, lab draws, and patient education, um, and really have been um, incredible. I'll share some pilot data with you in just a second, but um, the referral criteria for this program are HEFREF with an EF less than 40%, um, and at least one admission in the last six months, um, evidence of difficulty accessing outpatient care, and um, uh, experiencing adverse social determinants of health. Um, this is data that they shared with me from their pilot program of the first 10 patients that they enrolled. You can see that before the pilot in the one year and two years before, um, there were a, a high utilization of acute care, including admissions and ER visits. 
after the pilot program, you can see that every single patient had reduction, um, some quite dramatically. If you look at patient eight and patient 10, you can see like very dramatic um, reductions in the, in the acute care utilization. And this is not just for heart failure presentations, this is for all um, acute care for any cause. Um, I think impressive too is the fact that all of these patients were um, open and very engaged with care. Um, these were patients, many of whom who had never um, been able to show up for a clinic appointment, but I think this just speaks volumes to the, the care that Kate and Jamie provide and how they were able to build trusting relationships with, with all of these patients. Um, uh, based on this pilot data, um, they were recently approved to continue this program going forward for at least the next two years, and they've moved full-time to five days a week, and their program has grown to now serve 64 patients, which is super exciting. Um, so coming back to our patient from the beginning of this talk, um, he was referred to the Community Heart Failure Program. Um, given his struggles with medication compliance, Kate and Jamie had this like ingenious idea to use an alarmed pillbox. Um, it is bought on Amazon. It's only $55. And it basically, you fill medicines for the whole month and it gets locked. And every day it rotates to the, to the new day and it'll sound both an audible alarm and flash an LED light when it is time to take the medicines. And it'll continue to alarm until the medicines are taken out. Um, for about two, I think, I think two hours, otherwise it rotates to the next day. And so when you come back, it's also really easy to kind of assess medication compliance as well, or sorry, adherence as well. Um, and you can see that he was still on very modest doses of GDMT, um, but he, through this intervention, was able to start taking them very consistently and his compliance went to 100%. Um, he reported that he was still using meth and heroin, but less. And after just three months of this GDMT regimen, you can see that his echo, which are the three images on the bottom, while not completely normal, are dramatically better than they were when he was diagnosed. Um, clinically, he was able to come off of loop diuretics. He has NYHA class one symptoms and reports that he's able to walk to the store that's a mile away and back without any limitation. And he's remained out of the hospital since this echocardiogram performed over six months ago. Um, so if you're as impressed with these data as I am and want to get your patients referred to the Community Heart Failure Program, um, you would place a referral in EPIC just like you would for another any other cardiology referral, select Harborview, and then in the drop-down menu, um, click on Community Heart Failure Program, and please fill out the smart phrase. Um, particularly important is to fill out the patient's contact information so we can reach them. Um, and then just to give a shout out to both Kate and Jamie, who recently won uh, the Nursing Clinical Inquiry Award of the Year um, for all of the um, incredible work that they've done with the Heart Failure uh, Program. And they're also invited to speak at AHA this year. Um, and so you'll probably see them there and hear more about the great things that they're doing. Um, moving on to the second thing um, going on at Harborview, there's a pilot program um, of a cardiology and addiction medicine clinic there. This is born out of a QI project that showed that of the 213 patients that were seen at Harborview Cardiology Clinic in 2022 with methamphetamine-associated cardiomyopathy, there were only nine referrals that were placed to addiction medicine and zero patients um, from those referrals connected with addiction medicine. Um, I think that we can do better. And so our goal is to increase engagement in addiction care and to help try and streamline the processes to get patients connected. Um, as many of you know, the Harborview Cardiology Clinic has moved to the 9th and Jefferson building. And in that space, one day a week, there is now an addiction medicine fellow and attending that are embedded there. Um, and they're helping um, uh, manage the, the substance use piece for a lot of our patients. This pilot started in February and is um, expected to go at least until June. So far, they've seen 20 patients, um, but have had many more visits than that, including the, the follow-up of those patients. They're mostly seeing alcohol and methamphetamine use, um, but and then they're currently applying for funding to continue this program. And with Medicaid recently approving contingency management, we hope that that's something that we would be able to implement as a part of um, a future co-management clinic, similar to the one that I shared um, that's happening in San Francisco. 
Um, and then lastly, um, uh, Cooper and I have put together what, what I'm terming right now, I guess, the methamphetamine research collaboration. This is a group of actually 20 to 30 people who are all interested and passionate about um, caring for patients um, who use methamphetamine. Um, it's a very multidisciplinary group, which I think is really exciting. Um, it includes cardiology, addiction medicine, psychiatry, pulmonology, and internal medicine. Um, and it includes trainees from the entire pipeline, in addition to um, uh, attendings, nurse practitioners, nurses, and pharmacists. And so it's a really um, exciting group where we can come together and talk about ways that we can advance patient care all through sort of an academic lens. Um, so to summarize, um, reaching the end of my talk, um, the take home points that I hope you remember are that methamphetamine causes a toxin induced cardiomyopathy. Um, uh, features that favor reversibility include a patient's ability to stop using methamphetamine, less fibrosis ex extent, less chamber remodeling on echo. Um, I think all of us can um, strive to provide empathetic and trauma-informed care for all patients. I want to emphasize that contingency management works, um, that we should be getting all of our patients on optimal guideline-directed medical therapy, and please refer your patients to us at Harborview. Thanks, Danny. That was incredible. Um, I learned so much and I have to say that I, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I definitely walk away feeling more hopeful. Um, and uh, and this is actually the data from the community heart failure program it was very nice to see because as a, as a physician who attends at Harborview, certainly for the past year or so, I feel like I'm seeing less of the same patients. And so the, this just validates um, everything that I'm seeing. So it's very incredible. Um, and thank you for, for sort of uh, continuing the work um, that, that you guys are gonna be doing. I, I foresee great things coming forward with, with you at the helm there. Um, I did have uh, one question that sort of gets back to something you addressed very early on, which was the gender differences in meth-induced cardiomyopathy. And, um, and I had seen that also anecdotally, um, and I wasn't sure if it's because of, of the differences in use, or is it um, more that men tend to, males tend to develop more of the cardiomyopathy aspect and, and or, or women develop more of the pulmonary hypertension. I'm not sure if there is a, if, um, if there's a pathophysiologic difference or is this a difference in use? Do you have a sense of that at all? I don't, and I tried to look into that too, because it is really notable. There's a paper from 2018 that really showed nicely that you're right, women are more likely to develop the PAH phenotype from meth, whereas men are more likely to, to develop cardiomyopathy, and they saw this in mouse models as well. I don't, I don't know if it's a pattern of use or um, some other factor, but I, I suspect it's something biological, um, uh, but I don't think we fully understand why why gender is. differences exist. Yeah. Um, I, I have more questions, but I kind of wanted to show it, throw it out to the audience a little bit. I think one of my shortcomings in, in treating this population is, is trying to kind of meet them where they're at. Uh, and, and maybe that's just my pessimism and saying, I don't think this person can do GDMT they need to prove to me that they need to follow up before I can put an ICD in them. Um, I don't think that they're going to be able to handle so many referrals, so I don't refer them to addiction medicine. Um, anecdotally, I mean, I know those are kind of three different things that you can take different approaches to, but but what's been your experience in 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 meeting these patients with optimism and, and trying to push them a little bit harder or, or getting them on, on BID meds and please feel free to call on Kate and Jamie too to answer. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's a really um, common sentiment that I think a lot of providers who want to help like often feel stuck and sometimes frustrated that um, the tools that we currently have are inadequate in serving this population. That's one of the reasons why I think the work that what Kate and Jamie are doing is so incredible because I think that for many patients, they are not um, at the point in their lives where they're able to 
come to clinic appointments. And when you don't have your basic life needs met, I think that sometimes can be a very tall ask. And so I think Kate and Jamie are sort of changing the way that we deliver healthcare in a way that um, is more equitable and brings healthcare to the patient in a way um, that they've all been very receptive to. And so I think it's kind of turning what is normal and, um, you know, going to clinic, like seeing 20 patients, writing your notes, you know, I think, I think it's about changing that perspective and really centering it around the patient. Um, and I think we've already seen evidence that that's, that that's working for patients who have sort of not, um, not thrived in the current, the current way that we do healthcare. I don't know if you have, Jamie might have something to say too. No, I thank you. I totally agree. I think there's a... Meeting patients where they are seems to have such a huge impact on outcomes. And I also think that um, this kind of gets into what you're talking about with like what we prescribe them at discharge, kind of recognizing that we can make improvements both in functional abilities and even in things like EF, um, if we can get people to take medicines consistently, even if they are not on optimized GDMT. Um, and we can also, by seeing them in the community and meeting them where they are and not making their healthcare contingent on quitting Medicaid or quitting methamphetamine or other stimulants, um, they're more likely to engage and then continue to show up for care with cardiology, but also with other services and that, um, there can be improvement and recovery even with continued use. Danny, thank you. That was great. Um, I was wondering if there's any research, and I know this would be somewhat controversial, but just thinking analogous to the way methadone and suboxone have become mainstays of opiate addiction uh, cessation. Is there any research in using long-acting amphetamines um, as uh, bridges to abstinence because they seem to be quite a bit safer than methamphetamine in, in terms of a cardiotoxicity. I mean, of course they promote hypertension, but they don't seem to promote LV thrombus and dilation and systolic dysfunction as much. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Um, what I learned from the addiction medicine folks is that people have definitely looked into that in the same way that for opiate use disorder, um, you would think that it would work, but unfortunately, it does not pan out that way. I think sometimes we, they still use Adderall and you know some prescribed stimulants. Um, if they if they um, you know ask patients the why why do you use what drives you to use, a lot of people are self medicating ADHD, and so I think if the underlying diagnosis is they actually really do have ADHD and that's why they're using stimulants. I think I think using um, something like Adderall could be effective and helpful in that in those specific patients. Um, but I don't think widely across the board as a treatment for stimulant use disorder, it has been shown to to reduce use or be effective. Yeah. Re really, really nice talk, Danny. Um, very informative. Um, I'm very interested in the piece about mechanism that you touched on a little bit earlier in your presentation. And in particular, like the opportunities maybe to think about this genetic second hit hypothesis. Um, but you know the key to understanding mechanism is really having a lock on on the exposure. And I'm curious if anyone has done any work actually sampling and looking at what these patients are taking. We know that methamphetamine is produced in a range of places um, where we don't know that much about what chemicals are going into it. Um, have others run mass spec on what people are taking or have you thought at all about how to better understand what the exposure actually is that these folks are getting? Um, that's a really good question. I am blanking on the name of the website, but there is for King County um, a website in which they have sort of tested everything that is quote unquote fentanyl, everything that's quote unquote methamphetamine. And they've done, I think, mass spec on it to see kind of the contamination of other substances within within that. And so they'll report that, you know, like X percent of what is considered methamphetamine is actually fentanyl or is actually contaminated with these other substances. So I have seen data on that. Um, I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of data though, on like the potency of, of the drugs that are coming out. I mean, there was some longitudinal data from like the early 2000s to the late 2010s, there was some graphs that I found that like the potency of the meth that is available in the U.S. has dramatically increased to like almost 100% potency. 
um, when the shift of a lot of the production started coming from Mexico. Um, but I haven't seen any like recent data um, kind of more granularly defining the exposure. So that would be that would be something either I'm not aware of or something that we could look into. Hey, Danny. Thank you for this important talk. Now, I'm particularly interested in the content and the contingency management. And now that it's been approved by Washington State Medicaid, what are the next steps to rolling out contingency management at Harborview? And how do you in um, how what are some ways that we could in, uh, you might be able to incorporate contingency management in the registry? Yeah, I think so. I'm very excited. Um, I think everything comes down to funding. And um, if we can get funding for it, I think we have a lot of people who are very excited to try and, you know, roll out a co-management um, cardiology addiction medicine clinic. Um, I think that um, I think that right now the pilot program that is currently going on, um, they are not currently doing contingency management, but kind of need approval from the higher ups in the hospital to be able to give basically something of monetary value to patients. And so I think that there's a number of um, logistical barriers that I think will need to kind of be be overcome. But I think that's not impossible, um, especially because it's been so effective. Kate may have more updated information about this. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Danny. You're yeah. just awesome. That was great. Um, just, just this week, we met with the AAG of Washington State um, to try to do contingency management at UW. So if there are people who are interested and want to be present, the more from them that we had physicians showing up and leadership and people really, you know, from Tim Dellett down to me, um, showing that they were interested and wanted to work on this, the better. So just let me know where Sarah Lighty, she's kind of spearheading it. But yeah, we're talking to Washington State. So that's exciting. That is super exciting. Wow. Right. Yeah. Any other questions in the audience? Great. Um, I think that, uh, one, um, there was a question in the chat about ADD, ADHD, but I think you actually ended up answering that question. And then uh, one comment that Nona made, which was uh, very uh, illuminating, was um, about the gender differences. She reminded that alcohol use disorder is also higher in men, and, and that can serve as a second hit. So uh, thanks, Nona, for that comment. Um, thank you, Danny. This was incredible, and um, I'm so excited to see kind of where you go with this um, and sort of take all the leadership that you've already shown in fellowship and just sort of spearheading this program with Cooper and and, uh, and Kate and um, uh, Kate and the team there. So thank you. Jamie, yeah. Kate, Kate and Jamie, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone.